developed as the mass production version of the RX-78 II Gundam, the RGM-79 Jim and its many variants would quickly become the Federation's mainstay weapon. Despite its somewhat rocky start. So today we'll be having a look at all of the Jim variants of the One Year War and the best pilots who were behind their controls. Brought to you by the best VPN around, NordVPN. Whether you need to dodge some of those pesky region locks or you just want some more security online, Nord is there to supercharge your internet experience. I couldn't live without it anymore and if you too want to join the Nord side, by using the link down below or the code KKRT, you'll not just get a sweet discount, but you'll also be supporting the channel. But before we had the RGM-79 Jim, sometimes also affectionately called the Vanilla Jim, we had two pre-production versions. One for space, the Jim Early type, and one for Earth, the Jim Ground type. And with the Jim Early type, things didn't really look like they were off to a great start. While it was a perfectly fine mobile suit on paper, its actual combat records left something to be desired. And in fact, our Jim Early Type Ace pilot is less of an ace and more of a survivor. Terry Sanders Jr. His entire team was wiped out and he was only able to survive thanks to the best ball pilot around, Shiro Amada. On the ground though, things went much better with the Jim ground type. This machine was modeled after the Gundam ground type and would be extremely important for the Federation. Along with the Gundams, these units would be stationed at the most important fronts where they would not only score important victories, but also provided the Federation with much needed information for future mobile suits and mobile suit combat strategies. One such team was Delta Team, consisting of Matt Healy, Anish Lofman, and Larry Radley. They would book great results with these gyms and would keep using them even after the introduction of the standard gym. This was because even though the standard gym was more versatile, the gym ground type was more powerful. But that's of course not to say that the standard gym was weak. Despite its not so great reputation as mere cannon fodder, it did manage to surpass the Gundam in certain fields, like acceleration and maintainability. Its greatest asset though was its aforementioned versatility. Even though its standard armaments consisted of just a pair of Vulcan guns, a beam saber and a beam spray gun, the gym could be outfitted with many more weapons, making it suitable for just about any situation on any location. And no one showed the gym's might better than Charles Kissingham, the Federation's number 4 ace who managed to shoot down 52 mobile suits and 2 ships with nothing more than the vanilla gym. But at the same time there was also a lot of feedback on the gym that said that it lacked firepower. So the Federation took some inspiration from the gun cannon, slapped a cannon onto the gym and called it the Gym Cannon. And one of these units was piloted by Lido Wolf, the Federation's number 3 ace with 68 mobile suit and 4 ship kills. And when the big battles moved from the ground to space, a more lightweight and agile version was created, dubbed the Jim Cannon Space Assault Type. We don't know the names of those who piloted these machines, but they were all said to be ace pilots. Other pilots then didn't want more weapons on their machine, they wanted a more agile machine. And for this, a very simple solution was devised the Gym Light Armor. As its name indicates, as much armor as possible was removed and even the Vulcan guns were removed to save as much weight as possible. And instead of the weaker rapid fire beam spray gun, it now used a custom beam rifle that traded more firepower for less shots. 
all of which made this gym ideal for hit and run tactics and was especially favored by fighter pilots turned mobile suit pilots. Captain Gary Rogers in particular would become famous for using this speedy gym. And it is also rumored that a gym command light armor existed. Combining both the firepower and the speed then was the gym sniper custom. But don't let its name fool you, because for some reason, at some point, Sniper had become the designation for a high performance mobile suit in the Federation. As a result, anyone piloting a gym sniper custom was the best of the best that the Federation had to offer. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that the Federation's number one ace, Kenneth A. Jung, used one of these as his main unit. He managed to shoot down 149 mobile suits and three ships. But even though he was the best performing in terms of numbers, Francis Backmire must be mentioned here as well. Now, due to the Jim Sniper custom being assigned to ace pilots, many of them would customize their units to their liking but their standard configuration would be the one pioneered by Francis. Another famous variant then was used by the Shimoda squad, whose units had missile launchers installed on their backpacks for even more firepower. And talking about customized gym sniper customs, the unit would also be further developed into two units that would specialize in protecting Federation fleets. The gym intercept custom would use its high speed booster unit to intercept enemy units en route, and the Gym Guard Custom would use its giant shield to protect the ships from any enemy mobile suits who managed to escape the Intercept Custom. Unfortunately, we don't know of any particular Aces who used the Guard Custom, but the Intercept Custom was used by Hope Galloway, who modified his unit with the Ignis, turning it into the Gym Intercept Custom Ignis. And continuing with the Sniper units, there also was the Gym Sniper, which was simply a gym ground type that was painted green and given a sniper rifle, and the Gym Sniper 2. Arguably the most powerful gym of the entire One Year War. And just like the Gym Sniper Custom, despite its sniper designation, it was actually a high performance all round ace mobile suit. It had superior speed, superior power, superior sensors and a huge arsenal of powerful weapons to choose from. On paper, it was even set to rival or surpass the performance of the legendary RX-78-2 Gundam. And while not every team was able to live up to these paper specs, the White Dingo team with their slightly customized versions absolutely did. And of course, I once again have to mention Lido Wolf here, who used a Jim Sniper 2 in the closing stages of the war. And in recent years, a Monk only predecessor unit to this amazing unit has also popped up the Jim Dominance, a unit that definitely had a very dominant performance and was used by Yu Kajima and Philip Hughes two members of the feared guinea pig team. Although you might be more familiar with them as the team from Blue Destiny. The stock Gym Sniper 2 then can trace its roots all the way back to the Gym Cold Districts type. An often overlooked machine that was made for combat in extremely cold environments. A fact that also made this a very rugged machine that would prove deadly in the right hands, like the aforementioned guinea pig team. And with its high performance, the Cold Districts type would also be very influential for future mobile suits, with its direct lineage being the Gym Command, a unit that was rolled out with two different backpacks, a high mobility omnidirectional version for the Gym Command Space type and a more standard looking version for the Gym Command Ground type. The ground type would again be most famously used by the guinea pig team, whereas the space type would really be able to show its colors in the hands of Franklin Novotny, the number 6 Federation ace 
who got his kill count solely with this machine. And I also have to mention Tenneth A. Jung here, because he also used the machine. These two then would be further developed into the Gym Sniper 2, completing our loop. But back to the influence of the Gym called District's type. It used some of the data of the early type in its development, and in turn, its data would be used for the Gym Kai. The unit that would serve as basically the template for the Federation's future mobile suit development. Despite being deployed in quite some numbers, its most notable pilots would all come from after the One Year War, like South Burning or Kamuna Tachibana, who piloted a commander version. A slightly customized version, though, was used by Tosh Gray and Stoll Mannings, the Jim later type. This was a Jim Kai that was outfitted with the backpack of a Jim Command space type, had additional attitude control thrusters and vents installed, and had its single backpack mounted beam saber replaced by two beam sabers that were now located on the back skirt. Its more famous variant then was the Jim Striker, a heavily armored close combat variant that was made in response to Xeon's feared goof. It came with a powerful twin beam scythe, but perhaps its most devastating asset was its most infamous pilot, Yuji Arcana from Nemesis. Its reactive armor then was a development of the very successful reactive armor used on the Desert Gym. A unit that was fine tuned for desert warfare with things like extra dust proofing and better cooling. Unfortunately though, not a lot is known about these units or the pilots who used them. What we do know is one more unit that they inspired and the unit that they were developed from, the Jim Land Combat Type. These units were mainly deployed on the European front and their biggest improvement over the standard Jim was their increased armor. Something that the Desert Jim would then improve upon with its reactive armor and its most famous weapon was a giant railgun. But again, not too much is known about its pilots during the One Year War. The other development from the Desert Gym then was the Armor Gym, arguably one of the strongest ground units that the Federation had. Rather than a completely new unit though, it simply consisted of an upgrade package for the Vanilla Gym. It had reactive armor that was supplemented by heavy thrusters. And these didn't just compensate for the new armor, but actually increased the gym's mobility. It was even estimated that this gym could go toe to toe with Xeon's Fear Dom. On top of that, it also had excellent service ability. Like, in short, it was perfect. So it might surprise you to hear that there aren't a lot of combat records for these machines. And that is because Desert Rommel managed to raid a warehouse that had many of the conversion parts. Only a few could be scavenged and by the time that they could make more, the war was already over. The most famous one used during the war was by Barry Abbott from the Witch Hunt Squadron. And this lack of combat records is going to continue for most of the remaining gyms in this video, but each for very different reasons. First up, the Gym Nightseeker, a spec ops machine that was meant to infiltrate Xeon bases under the cover of night. They were outfitted with a stronger sensor and had extra thrusters for their drop operations. These allowed them to make faster drops and also allowed them to make jumps of up to 400 meters to quickly return to their mothership. Both speed and stealth were essential to these machines. And because they were of course so secretive, we only know that they were deployed by the elite 33rd company and that a Gem Nightseeker 2 was also developed. These gyms used the same face visor and thrusters, but the base unit was now a gym light armor instead of a vanilla gym. Again, very little is known about their operations during the One Year War, other than the fact that they were used by the 33rd company and that they were extremely effective. Not so effective then were the Federation's Marine units. 
faced with Xeon's amphibious mobile suits, the Federation decided to counter them with a marine variant of the Jim. First was the Jim Sloop, an unarmed version that was basically the mobile suit equivalent of putting on some scuba gear. It could dive, but it was really only usable for reconnaissance purposes. And as soon as their other project began gaining more traction, which was the Aqua Gym, the sloop almost immediately fell out of favor, and they were quickly converted back to regular gyms, with the exception of two data gathering units. Unfortunately, that was also the best thing I can say about the Aqua Gym. It's better than the gym sloop, and maybe the marine Zaku, but that's it. It does look quite deadly with its many thrusters, torpedo launchers, claws, and harpoon gun, but it was no match for Xeon's more advanced amphibious mobile suits. They did see combat, but in general, Underwater combat was less important than land combat and space combat, so not a lot of records remain, and maybe that's for the better for the reputation of the Aqua Gym. We do know that two of these clunkers were tested out by Philip Hughes and Simona Phyllis, and that its parts were used to transform the Gym Dominance into the Gym Dominance Underwater Equipment Type, a unit that was used by Yu Kajima. Definitely the weirdest gym on this entire list then was the Gym Juggler. A gym with remote controlled balls in an attempt to recreate the all range attacks that Xeon's new type machines were capable of. It was not very successful. Also, this was originally a video game only mobile suit that has since made some cameos in anime and manga. But because of its video game origins, the best ace pilot for this Federation machine is Mula Flaga. Yes, that Mula Flaga. And then last, but definitely not least, we have the Gym Trainer. A mobile suit that was obviously never intended to see frontline duty, because it was made as a training mobile suit. While it did have the same base performance as the gym, it of course also had a lot of cost cutting measures that made it less than ideal for actual combat. It lacked head mounted Vulcan guns, and while its armor looked mostly the same, it was both cheaper and weaker. And because it's a training mobile suit, it also had a cockpit that could house two people, the instructor and the trainee. And those were all of the gyms used by the Federation during the One Year War. In the main Universal Century timeline. In Thunderbolt, we get a very different version of the vanilla gym that also looked significantly more advanced and way stronger which then got developed into the Gundam head, which is just the same thing again, but with a Gundam head, and the Jim Cannon, a unit that doesn't look that different from the mainline Jim Cannon, comparatively speaking. And then from the origin, we again get a somewhat different vanilla Jim, which again looks more powerful than its main counterpart, especially so when you hook up the cannon to its backpack or slap on its additional missile launchers. But what makes things easy for this video is that many of its variants are actually almost one to one with their mainline Universal Century timeline. Things like the Jim Sniper Custom, Jim Intercept Custom or Jim Nightseeker. The unique variants are the Jim Close Combat Type used by Sailor Mass, the Jim Slager Law Custom used by Slager Law, and the Jim Long Range Type. And those were really all of the gyms of the One Year War. So let me know down below which one you would use if you were a Federation pilot during the One Year War. For me, obviously I would go for the Jim Sniper 2. After working my way up as a fighter pilot who went to the gym light armor, 
who then got a Gym Sniper Custom, and then finally got a Gym Sniper 2 for the Battle of Abawa Q. So don't forget to check out NordVPN with the link down below. As always, a big thank you to the Patreon supporters, I hope everyone watching has a great day, and I'll see you all next time.